Thank you, Melchior. Yeah, like uh, the uh, finance uh, talk that we heard just now, the out-of-band management talk was something that came up in the Enel Nork coffee break. And I figured it was a nice subject to, to talk about, actually, because an out-of-band network can be a little bit more complicated than you think. And um, I think most people will know me. Um, just to be sure, I am the CTO of u Networks. And then later on, Job will present about the NTT out-of-band network. And we will have a small discussion about both our uh, setups and the pitfalls of each other's networks. Hopefully, this will help you get uh, your out-of-band network in a uh, better shape than uh, it might possibly be right now. And uh, as a result, we hope to make the internet become better manageable. Um, what we do as Fusix is we operate two star networks here in the Netherlands. Um, we did have a US operation, but we stopped with that uh, earlier this year. We automate a lot, so we have a very small staff and we pride ourselves that we have lovely clients. But all the automation means that we have a, a big reliance on a lot of metadata because our uh, customer portal uses lots of information that comes from the network. And in addition, the network is provisioned through the automation platform. So we also need a secure and reliable way for the uh, software that we have to talk to the network. So when you think about out-of-band networks, that's just to connect to your equipment in case there is a problem, right? That must be it. Well. Think again, because what happens if it isn't anymore? Um, when I started to uh, look at uh, what we are actually doing across the out-of-band network, I came to this list, SNMP, S-Flow, uh, or NetFlow feeds that we are running through it uh, for DDoS detection and for uh, making uh, it uh, easy for our customers to see what kind of traffic they are doing through the portal. We monitor BGP sessions that we have uh, software logging into the routers to check on the status of the BGP messages so we can alert our customers if a session goes down. Of course, the whole network is configured through the out-of-band network. We have VPN access to uh, go, get into the out-of-band network in case uh, you need to configure something manually, which I don't advise anymore, but it does happen. And obviously, once you are on that out-of-band network, we have an internal DNS view, so we can just type uh, uh, core router zero NICF, and then bam, I'm logged into the thing uh, whenever I'm uh, connected to the VPN. And then, of course, yeah, in the end, finally, there is still the emergency CLI access via SSH or the console port, which is something that we also handle through the out-of-band network. So yeah, we do have that. but. Um, when I started to realize how much we are actually doing through this out-of-band network, yeah, it became clear that we had to improve this and make sure that it gets better and better all the time. Because what do you usually do when you want to put up an out-of-band network somewhere in a data center? Well, you call uh, your uh, nicest uh, competitor or you look at who is your direct neighbor in the data center and you ask, can I have a 100 meg port with 10 meg commitment? And then you pay through the nose for the cross connect to go to that port. So that doesn't really scale. We are in almost 30 data centers right now. And if I have to pay uh, 100 euro a month for each cross connect just for out of band, that is a very significant expense. I'm sure that will be one that Jochem and Steven will not approve. Um, then there is the other way, putting a 4G router somewhere in, in each rack, in each data. Well, have you ever tried to use 4G in a data center? I can tell you in some places it does work. But then still, you will have to get 30 4G routers with 30 SIM cards and hope that your IP address will not change or you need to configure it to, to get back to some kind of management server or something. But I don't like 4G either. Um, okay, you say, then we just order a, a DSL line from uh, Freedom Internet, for instance, I don't know. But have you ever tried to get a DSL line in a data center? There is this ISRA punt that the whole thing needs to be connected to, and you have already noticed with how much hatred I say the words ISRA punt, uh, because this is one of the most difficult parts of a whole data center. It is almost impossible to get a DSL line to run in a data center, I think. But Okay, your mileage may vary, I don't know, but for us, this wasn't a scalable solution. So what we did 
we built an in-band, out-of-band network. We have basically two approaches. Some of our data centers, we have a simple dark fiber that goes back to our core sites. And it is very easy because we already use WDM and we just take the one gig optics that, uh, that we bought in 2014 when we still had a one gig network. And uh, we use that in, the, in, a, in, a, in a color dedicated to the out of band and that's wonderful. There are also locations where we uh, lease a wave uh, if the dark fiber isn't really affordable enough compared to the number of customers in that site. And then we will configure one VLAN across that wave uh, to be specifically for uh, the out of band network. So um, I hear you guys thinking, how does he do an in band, out of band network? Uh, how did that, this guy ever get his networking degree? Well, uh, to be sure, I don't have a networking degree. I am a chemical engineer, so you can trust me. Um, but the trick is that we do this via BGP because we always have two dark fibers or two waves going to each data center. So in every data center where we have a pop, we put a uh, Juniper SRX as the out of band router. We put it in a private AS and then use BGP because of course, if you are a network engineer, then BGP is your tool. If all you have is BGP, then you use BGP. Um, the out of band router in each data center has its own slash 24 of private uh, legacy IP space, <laughs> IPv4 to both uh, core routers and it's announced over BGP and all the management ports of the switches, the ethernet ports of the air console servers and any power bars if we have them all connect to that uh, out of band router. So um, yeah, well, in the end, this is all one big network and uh, obviously you understand completely how this works. We have a nice uh, routing table on those SRX core out of band routers with uh, ASs and AS paths and all the out of band slash 24s in it. And the setup is totally redundant because we always have at least two dark fibers or two waves going to each location. As a bonus, uh, we get woken up if there is something wrong with the fiber or with a wave going to a location, because then the BGP session across the out of band uh, network will drop. So we have a very uh, a crude fiber cut detection system here as well. Now, um, how do we get onto this out of band network? I think this is uh, one of the easiest parts. Uh, we have uh, one uh, VPN server running OpenVPN in our own network, and there are two uh, friendly competitors networks that we also have such a machine in, and they also connect back to the out of band network. So this is how we get onto the network. Our uh, office location where I am right now is also connected to the network basically as if it was a data center too. So uh, our office IP address space here is also reachable directly from this out of band network if you are connected to um, uh, a wire, not to the guest Wi-Fi, strangely enough. <laughs> Sorry guys. In the out-of-band network, well, we have a, a fair number of, uh, of servers that are clustered and they have this internal DNS view. Of course, we have uh, LibreNMS running uh, to provide dashboards for ourselves and also for customers. Uh, I may need to look into building something uh, nicer there, but uh, who knows one day. And obviously all the software tools that we use for configuration changes, uh, flow tools for DDoS detection, everything is running on VM clusters that are connected to this out of band network. Uh, and all with the uh, idea in mind every time, it, does it have to be reachable through the public internet? If not, if there is no absolute necessity for it to be reachable on the public internet, then we will not give it a public IP address and it will just run in that out of band network. Now, the question is, Niels, are you happy running your in-band, out-of-band network? The answer is yes. And I have uh, seen Job's slides and in his like third slide, he is already going to tackle my whole story and try to push my legs away from under me because this is absolutely nothing that you should ever do. But I can tell you that our uptime on the out-of-band network has been 100%. 
since we replaced the core out of band uh, uh, routers with SRXs, of course, um, because we we did have a, a micro tick there that uh, that had a lot of SFP ports and was uh, nice uh, to be uh, configured as a router, but. Uh, I don't know, uh, maybe I should go back to school, uh, to networking school this time. Uh, the MicroTIC kept thinking that it was a layer two device and it kept uh, putting locations together on layer two at, at various unpredictable moments uh, in time. And I can tell you one thing, you don't know the definition of the phrase bad day until the day where you have a loop on your out of band network, uh, because there are many, many, many systems that do not like to see uh, their management Ethernet port being filled by spurious traffic. If you ask me, um, what can I do to improve things? Well, I can tell you that in our case, and I concede our case is pretty simple because we have a very easy setup network, which is fully redundant. But in our case, running an in-band out-of-band network is feasible. It works. I would advise against using a device that, uh, that will try to work as a layer two device as well. Uh, that, that would not be the best of things to do. Uh, so please take that advice. And if you want to know uh, if I can think of any improvements, well, actually I am enjoying the out-of-band network every day because Every time I log in to one of our routers or one of our switches, I use it. And every time a customer logs into our portal to look at this data, they use it. So it works. And um, that the only thing I can think of, of course, is to implement RPKI on our out of band. So I may want to read up on a book about that or something. I don't know. I think that when it comes to out-of-band networks, uh, the setup that we have in our case, we are pretty close to perfection. And um, well, I would love to hear what you guys think about it. That's it for me. Thank you, Niels. This is really interesting. And uh, some discussion already, uh, or some acknowledgements are already coming in via IRC. So there's actually people who agree with the way you, you're building the out-of-band network. And what, what I think is really interesting is that you are actually using it in production because um, yeah. what you see happening a lot indeed is that an out-of-band network is built in a lot of cases based on older equipment, which is not in use anymore. So we can use it for the out-of-band network. And then once it's configured and built, it's forgotten until you actually have a problem. Um, so I think that that is one of the maybe key lessons from your presentation, at least for myself, um, uh, that you should actually use the, the out of band. It is a policy decision. Do you want to use the out of band network as a main network and uh, run all your uh, data through it, like metadata, like S flow, like whatever? Or do you see the out-of-band network as something that you need just in an emergency? Well, I can I can tell you that uh, yeah, it, I, I've been doing this since 1999, and in various cases, I've been using the out-of-band network just as something that you would use in case of an emergency. And like you say, uh, if you wake up at three in the morning, you need to be able to log into your devices if if they are down. So you don't want to have to look up on a wiki page, which you can't reach if your device is down, how you would need to log into that device. And this is also a reason why uh, we do not use any like management VRFs or something on our out of band network. We just use the ethernet management port that is provided on the hardware itself. And no VRFs, no strange uh, IP views or additional routing tables. We just keep it simple and uh, keep it in technology terms that everybody can understand, even if that 3 a.m. call comes in. Okay, um, a question um, that came in via the chat. Um, how is uh, your out-of-band network uh, connected to the internet? If you want to uh, talk about it, in other words, um, how do you access it uh, from outside of the network? Yeah, we have uh, those uh, three VPN servers for that. We have one that runs in our own network, which is connected to public internet and out of band. 
And we have two from uh, friendly uh, competitors. Uh, hello, Eric. Hello, Thomas, <laughs> who provide us with links in various data centers. And uh, they also uh, are used to connect to the out-of-band network. Yeah. And so I suppose um, this is also based on a question that as you're using your network as part of your production network, you, I think you, you manage it 24-7 um, uh, as well. And so do you um, have uh, like official maintenance windows or do you still allow yourself or others to work on it during office hours? Well, this is a funny one uh, because indeed, once the out-of-band network gets so uh, so much use as it does in our case, then indeed you, you want to start looking at how to make this even more redundant. Um, and management, well, uh, we, we don't have a, uh, a, a maintenance window for the out-of-band network, to be honest. And pretty soon we are going to have to replace one of the switches with one that has more ports. So I do need to think of a strategy for that because this switch is basically connecting our our uh, our pki validators to the to the out of band network so this is a, as you will understand Melchior, a very important service and if we replace <laughs> that switch then it would be down so that that is not acceptable so uh, no we don't have maintenance windows for the out of band network uh, but uh, we do take care in keeping it managed and keeping it well run and i uh, intend for things to stay that way Okay, thank you, Niels. And um, we'll be back with you uh, uh, in, in short time. Um, I just heard that Jop is ready for his part of the presentation. So really interested to hear um, uh, what other ideas and, and options are available. Uh, Jop, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. My name is Job Snyders. I work for NTT's Global IP Network. And today I want to share with you how NTT has set up its out-of-band management network. So independent of whatever you call your in-band network. So in this very NLNOC live session, this phone is my out-of-band service with which I am in touch with the AV crew uh, to orchestrate the event. Uh, but the production network, so to speak, is my webcam and its connection to the internet. And it is very interesting to take a careful look at how interwoven is my internet network with other networks and how do the dependencies work and how can I reduce the dependencies on my own network by building uh, an out-of-band network. What is an out-of-band network useful for? There are many, many applications. Niels highlighted a few. Uh, in the case of NTT's network, we have uh, a few specific things that we use this specific out of that network for. There is routine operations. These are scheduled activities uh, that are planned, put on a roster, and people take care of it. Um, and you can think of things like the upgrading the router software. Uh, when on a really big router, those chassis-based uh, devices, you, you upgrade the software, it is very nice to have the equivalent of a sort of VGA and keyboard connector into the device to guide the device through its software update procedure. Uh, in a similar fashion, when uh, physical work is performed uh, on the device, uh, physical work which may impact the surface, for instance, if a, uh, a line card or fabric card uh, is, is affected, uh, it's good to have this, this second connection into your device. And there's, of course, incidents. When a router disappears from our in-band network, our production network, it can have many causes. It could be a management failure, management blade failure. It could be uh, other hardware components. It could be a power outage in the data center. It could be a fiber cut. And having an out-of-band network that is reliably not depending on your own network can help uh, triage such situations to very quickly understand what is going on. So NTT operates multiple autonomous systems. There is of course 2914, which you all know and love, but separately from 2914, we have a different ASN on different routers with different upstream providers on different connections with a different routing policy, it is separate. And that is our IPOOB. And to understand why I'm so enthusiastic about this new 
IP-based out-of-band network, uh, I would like to offer a picture of our previous out-of-band network, uh, which was more anchored in uh, how uh, you would envision a traditional telco switchboard. What we previously did was we would order a phone line into each and every pop where NTT has equipment, regardless of where on the planet it is. That phone line hooks up to a modem. The modem hooks up to the aux port, auxiliary port of a console server. And once we reach the console server, uh, we could branch out via serial connections to the individual components that uh, are part of the out-of-band network. But the trouble with this is uh, that in many places, it has become increasingly hard to order true phone lines suitable for this type of data transfer. Uh, more and more providers are uh, pretending to offer a POTS service, a plain old telephone service, but are behind the scenes converting it uh, through various VoIP codecs, which uh, destroy the ability for us to interact with such devices. Uh, there were more downsides. For instance, this system was only used when needed. Uh, and when you need it, uh, discovering that it's broken or that the phone line got disconnected or whatnot uh, is, of course, suboptimal. And ordering phone lines is just, it's, it's very, very challenging. So when we looked at out of band, uh, what we need, what are our requirements? What we were looking for is that all management modules, so the management blades in all our routers uh, uh, are connected permanently via an RS-232 connection to some kind of device, which we can access through SSH, which in turn is, of course, access via IP, uh, perhaps an IPsec, all the way back to our uh, operations center. We want all serial lines to be concurrently available because maybe people are troubleshooting something on multiple devices at the same time. And if it's a single user or a single line device, that's, that's not optimal. We want all serial traffic to be locked for debugging and archiving purposes. And we wanted a system where multiple users can work concurrently on the same serial lines. Furthermore, simplicity. Uh, a cookie uh, stamp recipe was desired so that it's very easy to turn up new out-of-band gear uh, without having to jump through a lot of steps. So, And then finally, we need uh, uh, flexibility in how we connect these out-of-band routers in our POPs to other parts of the out-of-band network. Um, we wanted flexibility that we can choose between 4G, which in some data centers works and some it doesn't, optical, electrical, single mode, multi-mode, you name it. Uh, we wanted all options. So this was the solution uh, colleagues arrived at. Uh, it is a Cisco 4331 uh, device, which uh, has the very interesting capability of providing lots of asynchronous ports. Uh, you can stick up to 48 serial uh, connections in this device if you uh, wire it up with the correct modules and cables. Uh, you can put uh, WAN modules in it of various uh, kinds, uh, which offers you the flexibility that I offered, uh, mentioned before. Uh, and this uh, device is hooked up to a Juniper switch, uh, which can be used to extend the out-of-band network without requiring additional out-of-band wide area network connections. Uh, so if we need more than 48 serial ports, we can just drop in a second one of these uh, connected to the switch. And the way the network is configured, all of this uh, comes up easily and automatically. And yes, the cool thing here is that we are using serial connections. The great advantage of using serial connections is that they have less of a dependency on the health of the management blade. Also, Via a serial connection, you cannot cause a layer two loop. And there have been multiple providers over the years that have reported that they connected their out of band uh, uh, Ethernet ports or the Ethernet management ports on the management blades into some kind of layer two construction. And a loop appears, and these management Ethernet ports have zero protection whatsoever uh, to deal with a broadcast storm. And this really can bring down entire nations. So uh, by focusing on the serial interface into, on all equipment as the primary means for the out-of-band network, uh, we, we 
get a lot of cool observations. For instance, if a kernel crashes, some kernels can still spit out some debugging information on the uh, serial console line, uh, but it's, it's also a safety mechanism. Uh, what that looks like. Here is a, a photo of an installation uh, that, that uh, is uh, yet to be wired to, to all equipment. Uh, but what you see in the, on the left side of the screen is a big trunk of green cables, which go into a specialized uh, multiple serial port per physical connector. Uh, and that branches out into uh, a cable per serial line that goes into a patch panel. And from there, it's very easy to connect everything up. And you also see the la layer two switch, which uh, can be used to extend the network or hook up other uh, devices that need some kind of out of band connection. And this is such a joy to work with. I can recommend it to everybody. So what does this look like on a more logical level? In the lower left, we have the OOB spoke. That's that Cisco 4331 connected to the OOB switch. And from there, multiple spokes can be connected uh, in a daisy uh, chain style. Uh, and from the OOB spoke, you branch out via RS232 connections to every device in the pop that has a serial port. The out-of-band uh, out spoke uh, gets its internet from competitors of NTT. We have made a very careful selection of uh, suitable suppliers and uh, analyzed how traffic from the spoke to the hub would, would uh, flow and if there are dependencies on NTT or not. Uh, but of course, you never know for sure. So there's multiple uh, IPOB hubs and each hub is on a different continent with different suppliers. So we increase the chances of a spoke being able to reach at least one of the hubs. Uh, between spokes and hubs, we use DMVPN and IPsec. This makes uh, dynamic IP addresses on the OOB spoke side uh, easy, uh, makes them a non-issue. We don't need to register anything. Uh, it just works. Then on top of this, uh, BGP runs, uh, which helps distribute the routing information within uh, the uh, out-of-band network, which is a real autonomous system connected to the real internet. Um, and then the, the hubs are the entry point from a device called the con server, console server. And we're going to uh, focus on that in a second. The operator connects to the, the centralized console server. And from there, via SSH, uh, the system jumps to the spoke. And then you are dropped into the serial line. So some of the considerations. Uh, we use a different ASN uh, that is a real internet ASN for this operation. Uh, the DMVPN hubs have their own globally unique prefixes uh, to reduce the dependence, to, to have no dependency on, on the NTT 2914 network. Uh, and we took uh, uh, special precautions and put in a lot of uh, effort to carefully select which networks would be suitable to deliver us this type of service. The configs on both the hubs and the spokes are static, but the robustness comes from the fact that all of it is done with dynamic routing protocols. So uh, whether we reboot a hub or certain connections or sessions go up or down, uh, the system should automatically uh, reroute to a better uh, path. And not NTT in this context really just means that to the best of our understanding, the provider has no dependency on NTT specifically to handle the traffic from the spoke to the hub, not to elsewhere, not to the whole internet. We, we purchased these transit services actually for just a tiny uh, portion of connectivity, uh, just hub and spoke, no other internet services are used. So this con server thing, what is it? Con server is magic. If you go to conserver.com, you can download this tool for free. It is a, an open source tool uh, that may give you a bit of a, a Unix feel, an old time C feel, but actually it is quite modern software. It is actively maintained and it is very useful. What Conserver does for us, it provides us with a multiplexer uh, that has multi-user support and has, uh, uh, allows for incredible freedom how exactly you connect to a specific console. 
So what is a console? The console is that serial port in the management place. That is basically a VGA plus keyboard equivalent, except it's without colors and a bit simpler. Uh, it's character based. And uh, these consoles must be reached somehow. And this can be either via a direct serial line connected to the com server server itself, or it could be transported over SSH and done via some uh, Cisco terminal server. Uh, Any way you want to connect to uh, uh, serial lines, uh, the con server is extendable and allows great flexibility in this regard. And con server is really important for us because we're managing thousands of serial connections and it is uh, without some kind of organization, without some consistent approach, uh, it would be very hard for us humans to exactly memorize how do we connect to a specific console on a specific device. So con server provides a sort of an abstraction layer between the nitty gritty details of how the wires are actually connected and how you reach them and what needs to be done to accomplish that connection and the user just jumping on it or multiple users jumping on it. What con server also offers us is persistent logging. So whatever happens on these consoles, it is stored in log files. So we can go back in time to, uh, for instance, correlate uh, a pop outage with what we saw as a dying gasp on the serial lines. Uh, and through ConServer, we are able to uh, monitor whether the serial connections actually work and are wired correctly. Because if you wire up all kinds of devices and somehow two cables got swapped uh, in a moment of urgency that is inconvenient. So we have programs that could repeatedly confirm that the serial connections are working as expected. And I think this type of monitoring uh, is, is crucial to any operation. So what does it look like? On a Unix shell, you can type in the command console. The co console command is the binary that clients use to interact with the con server daemon. And if I uh, am on this host and I type in uh, console and then a string of uh, characters, uh, in this instance, it showed me that there is in fact two management blades, two RSPs, each of them connected with serial uh, connection. And uh, I have to pick which of the two I want to connect to. So I complete my command uh, and then I'm dropped into the serial connection of that management blade in that Amsterdam pop. And if a colleague of mine would issue the same command, they are able to view what I am seeing. And if necessary, they can take over the write access to that specific serial line. So this makes it super easy for multiple people to look at the same screen, uh, which during upgrade or emergency uh, procedures can be very beneficial. So ConServer really is a collaborative tool, uh, but not based in JavaScript. Um, periodic maintenance. You, since we have DMVPN sessions, IPsec, uh, SSH needs to work, uh, the RS232 uh, needs monitoring. Uh, all of this is shoved into systems that will alert the entity knock when something is not working as expected. Uh, and this helps us ensure that the out of band network is available when we actually need it. Uh, we have a regression tool called Botmaster and that does the trickery with the RS-232 connections to verify if they are indeed uh, connected properly. So uh, yes, monitor your out-of-band network. And uh, it's, it's kind of funny because an out-of-band network, the way NTT uses it, like through routine operations and emergency operations, the out-of-band network doesn't need to be up that much. If we're lucky, if the out-of-band network is 5% up of the time, uh, that might be enough. But of course, that would be a weird type of uh, weird way of thinking. So the out-of-band network, despite not being used continuously, is marked as critical. And uh, uh, with all uh, connectivity providers involved, we have commercial uh, arrangements to ensure that we can get expedient support when needed. But uptime could be optional for this type of network because we're not running production traffic uh, through this network. Uh, it is merely for incidental management. 
So I feel this is a big difference with uh, the news approach. Um, and well, this this concludes my my presentation. I would love to know what you guys think, what questions you have, and I would like to point out that the best out of band is Tunisia's D. Thank you for listening. Yup, thanks for that uh, presentation, and um, I think it's interesting to see the the difference between solution entity implemented and and what Fusix implemented. Um, so um, first of all, uh, there were some um, appreciation shown for the conserver tool. Um, so that that is, I think, something more people will look into now. And we also uh, received some questions, um, a specifically question first for you, uh, Job. Uh, I've seen a console cable in the uh, out of band switch. How is that one managed? Does it also go to the 4331? In other words, is the switch connecting the console server connected to the console server? Yes. And uh, there's another detail I omitted because I was focusing very heavily on the out of band part of the network. But the backup connection for each of these 4331 uh, terminal servers is in band. Uh, so if our out of band provider is unavailable, it may negatively infect the work we can do in a certain pop. But if, it's, if it happens to be uh, work on a router that is not the uplink of the out of band connection uh, itself, then, then maybe the work can proceed. So we use. Uh, non-entity providers but we also as a backup have the entity backbone itself so why uh, sorry news uh, one more question first for uh specifically for job um uh, as you're using serial consoles do you uh by default dismiss hardware that doesn't offer a serial console when evaluating hardware for the for your network Yes, effectively we do. If uh, a vendor comes to to pitch their hardware and uh, decent management is not possible, then it will be hard to make the sale. Uh, and this is interesting because if you look at servers nowadays, you have iDRAC and Elon, which are actually separate computers inside the server. So if you somehow manage to connect into that separate computer, you can still do power management and you still have control over the chassis. But if you look at modern day Junipers and Cisco's, especially the high end models, there is no separate computer to do these environmental or, or hardware uh, operations. And this is really where serial is then the best next thing uh, available to us. But it would be interesting if uh, uh, more vendors would, would take the, the actual separate computer built into the router to uh, help with uh, out of bed management. Question for uh, both of you. Um, do you have procedures uh, in place uh, in case a uh, out of bound uh, router or similar device fails? In other words, that sort of ties back to the question, do you treat your out of band network as a production network? Um, so are there procedures in place? Are devices under support? Um, uh, for us, I can say that the devices that we use in the out-of-band network are usually under support for the core devices. The other ones we have spares here in stock, and we do keep backups of the configuration like they were production routers. So uh, if something would fail on the out-of-band network, then obviously there is no service that is down. Customers are still up. So we would proceed to replace the hardware as soon as possible with the configuration that we have in the backup store using uh, oxidized for this. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's similar yours, for uh, us. All our uh, uh, all devices under support. Uh, the when an out of band device fails, uh, there are procedures in place to either replace it from our own stock, or there's an arrangement with a distributor to to replace the device. But also, these devices are not needed for our production network. So, if there were to be a maintenance in a pop where the device somehow is filled, we just postpone that maintenance. That's part of our procedures as well. And uh, as it happens to be, knock on wood, the mean time between failure of this type of terminal server uh, happens to be quite good. So we don't see this 
too often. Yeah. I would like to point out something about serial console servers. Uh, and um, one of Job's uh, colleagues uh, in the tier one networking department, uh, the guys from Sweden, had a um, huge two-day outage on their biggest chassis in Amsterdam uh, about eight months ago, where they had replaced all the parts of the whole thing. And in the end, it turned out to be the console server sending garbage data to the console port <laughs> and the engine killing itself. Please configure your console servers correctly so they don't send garbage. Yes, pick a good console server, one that you know and have tested extensively. Jop, a question um, came in. Um, uh, uh, news was telling during his presentation that uh, they're actually using the out-of-band network in, uh, to configure the production network and, and devices. Um, are you doing the same? Because you presented that you have Botmeister checking the devices if they're reachable and if console works, but do you use out-of-band to configure the network as well? Or is it only out-of-band? Out-of-band serial lines are used to turn up equipment. So equipment will be shipped to a pod. The first thing that's connected is serial, then power, and uh, then the serial connection can be used to bootstrap the device to a config that it can reach the management host and we can push the full config to the device. Uh, but during normal operations, uh, unless it's something like a software upgrade, these connections are not used. We use in-band uh, SSH-based management to configure all devices. Um, Niels, do you think, are there any, let's say, rules of, um, uh, or um, uh, sort of baselines you can use depending on, because your network is a little bit smaller than entities network, could you say that it depends on the size of the network, um, uh, which solution uh, to choose, or how did you come up with your solution? Where did you got the ideas from? Um, for example, it, it's not that common to run BGP in your out-of-band network. Where did you get those ideas from and, and what made you make those decisions? Yeah, I think the most important part is that you need to decide what your out-of-band network is for. And this is why I like the fact that Job has presented about NTT and the fact that they use the out-of-band actually just for serial. While for us, it is a, a daily tool that, uh, yeah, once, to be honest, we started using the out-of-band ports for things. and. I think it was that I, I wanted to check if uh, if we could run the RPKI validators through out of band, and then uh, yeah, that worked. Okay, so but and then it yeah worse <laughs> it, it it became more and more that that started to run through the out of band network. So I think the the first thing is that policy decision for yourself. What do I want to run across the out of band network, and then you make the architecture that fits that policy decision. And obviously for us, the tool to use is BGP. That's that's the thing we all love, right? <laughs> I, I agree. I mean, without BGP, it's not real. <laughs> <laughs> I think that yeah, is yeah, a you're, very you're nice. Right. It's, uh, Go ahead, uh, we, we both call it out of bed networks, but it turns out that it's where, where we have entirely different definitions of what an out of bed network is. And I think for NTT, we were so used to using a phone line to dial into the serial line. And we loved the serial line part, but we did not like the phone line part. So when yeah. we set out to design this new generation IP OOP, uh, it went live in uh, 2017, 2018. Um, all we were really looking to replace was those darn phone lines. But the rest, you know, that was great. <laughs> uh, Especially right. since those phone lines are basically now running over IP anyway, so that doesn't really make it out of band. <laughs> yeah. And they are so expensive. You dial from Dallas into Brazil using a phone line. Yeah, it's, uh, it's cheaper to get some cross-connects. Yeah, so I think that the conclusion is uh, uh, probably that the approach is sort of the same as a production network, right? First scope, what, what it is for, uh, 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 gather your requirements, and then 
start building out of bound network is not just something you need to have but uh, really needs um, uh, time and a good design and, and and lots of considerations any last remarks in that perspective uh, Niels? actually not from me i hope that we have uh, contributed uh, to a more stable internet that is better manageable and uh, if people uh, want to know more about how we run this uh, then uh, i'm sure they will know how to find me Jopio, when he made the statement, we all love PGP, but do you want to add something? I think, unfortunately, I think we you... lost Jop. So yeah. with that, um, it's uh, this is, I think, the moment to conclude this uh, this, uh, this presentation. And, and with that, we are concluding presentations for today. So uh, Niels, uh, thank you. Job, uh, uh, thank you as well. Um, My apologies, and with that, I, I would like to a different internet connection. Ah, you're back. So the question was, do you have any last uh, words on out of bound uh, networking? Uh, yes, invest real money into it. It pays itself back so easily because if a software upgrade goes wrong or, or a device is fried and you need to at a deeper level of the, the systems boot procedure, take some action. It is absolutely invaluable uh, to have this type of equipment and have immediate access because remote hands is not cheap. Uh, it, and and these, the, the built materials that I listed may not seem that cheap, but if you think it through and you depreciate it over five years, it is such a cheap insurance policy to ensure the well being and health of your network. Uh, it pays itself back easily. So when you look for out of bed network, do not be afraid to look at what you may perceive as more luxurious or more expensive solutions, uh, because if you take the whole thing into consideration, then the difference between a 300 euro device uh, and a 3000 uh, euro device uh, is, is, can be ignored. It's not relevant. Uh, so invest in out of bed networks uh, and, and treat them well, treat them with love and respect. And with that, I think this this are brilliant words to conclude this uh, this short discussion.